Okay, so I think. Okay, welcome everybody. So it's a pleasure and an honor to, our, to have with us today Alessandra Celletti. Alessandra is currently professor of mathematical physics at the University of Rome Tor Vergata. And uh, she's, uh, her research interests are in the field of celestial mechanics and dynamical system. She gave an invaluable contribution to the development of the field and also to promoting the field, both in Italy and abroad. So she's a founding member of the Italian Society of Celestial Mechanic and Astrodynamic, which she chaired from 2001 to 2013. In 2018, she became president of the Scientific Committee in Celestial Mechanics of the International Astronomical Union, while in 2019, she had been awarded with the Dirk Bauer Career Award from the American Astronomical Society. Finally, in recognition for all her achievements, I want also to mention that the asteroid 117539s bear her name. So today she will speak about synergy between perturbative methods in machine learning techniques and celestial mechanics. So welcome, the floor is yours. So many thanks uh, for the introduction and uh, many thanks uh, for the invitation to the director and Professor Tamara Grava. It is my honor to be here today to give uh, this colloquium talk uh, whose title is uh, The Synergy Between Perturbative Methods and Machine Learning Techniques in Celestial Mechanics. So I want to say since uh, the beginning that I'm not an expert of uh, celeste uh, <laughs> machine learning. I worked on celestial mechanics, but uh, I'm new in the field of machine learning. And I want to see, uh, can I have the other microphone, sorry? so that I can move. Okay. Okay. So, um, uh, so the, uh, I, I want to see um, uh, the potential, the, the, uh, the, I see much potential in these uh, machine learning methods, and there were, but I see also lights and shadows, let's say. So um, uh, we are trying with uh, some collab young collaborators uh, to see whether we can use it in, uh, in uh, practical problems. But the main problems uh, will be those of celestial mechanics and also uh, of perturbation theory, that is uh, different theorems uh, that I'm going to illustrate in a moment. So um, does it work, this one? Okay, so I can move, which is better. So the, the, um, this is the summary of my talk. And uh, let me start uh, with an introduction. So the first of all, I would like to say the following, that is, uh, uh, if we deal with problems of celestial mechanics and astrodynamics, uh, we need to, to have uh, three main ingredients, uh, which are a good theory, a good mathematical theory, and then we want to have also, uh, we need to have a model, a good model, which uh, provides uh, within a good approximation a certain physical situation. And then we want to, that we aim to have good applications with uh, possible also practical uh, applications to problems of celestial mechanics. One of the most important uh, methods uh, which are used in celestial mechanics is perturbative methods, perturbation theory. And perturbation theory has two main features. That is, uh, it is an efficient theory, but it is also very complex. And to highlight uh, this aspect, uh, efficiency, efficacy, and complexity, I go, we go back to the 19th century, and I give two examples. The first one is uh, uh, related to the fact uh, that at the middle of the 19th century, the last planet known was Uranus. But uh, scientists uh, at that time were aware of the fact that uh, there were discrepancies between the theoretical prediction of the position of Uranus and uh, the astronomical observation. So in order to get rid of this discrepancy between theory and observations, uh, Leverrier used the perturbation theory, conje conjectured the existence of an extra planet, that placed at the right distance and with the right mass 
can explain the discrepancy between theory and observation. So, so he made the computations with very high precision. He sent uh, a, a, the, his computations to an astronomer, uh, Johannes Gall, in Berlin, who made uh, the observation of the sky and discovered the planet Neptune. So this was uh, the discovery of the planet uh, with perturbation theory, just with pen and paper. So it is a very effective theory, but on the other hand, it is also very complex. Uh, we stay at the same time, so I choose another example, that of uh, Charles Delaunay, uh, who made uh, a very precise computations of the ephemerides of the moon, so position and velocity of the moon, as it is shown here on the right panel. Um, he used perturbation theory. He made a very nice book, I'm very a fan of, the, of this book, and, uh, uh, which is uh, 1,000 pages long. And to, in order to write this book, which is shown here, Theory of the Motion of the Moon, he spent 20 years of his life uh, to make the computations. So, so why 20 years? Uh, these are the preliminary computations which are given in the first few pages. Uh, the, the equations are standard uh, Cartesian equations of motion. Then uh, he starts uh, to... <clears throat> to give uh, the explicit expression of uh, what is called uh, the perturbing function, I will be more precise in a moment, uh, so the function that uh, needs to be studied in order to get uh, the ephemerides of, of the moon. And uh, he expands uh, this perturbing function in Fourier Taylor series in the orbital elements. Okay, so the expansion of this function, as given by Delaunay, starts at page 33. It continues to page 34, 35, and ends up at page 54. So it is uh, 22 pages for the starting point of perturbation theory. But the ephemerides of Delaunay, the computation done by Delaunay, are, used, are still used nowadays by space agencies like NASA, European Space Agency, and so on. So the, these are the two main features. Uh, and uh, of course, in our applications, we would li like to have uh, effective theory and also, uh, but less complex, uh, <laughs> possibly by using uh, modern instruments. What is the, the main problem of celestial mechanics? As it is well known, it is the two-body problem. For example, the, the, the Earth under the gravitational attraction of the Sun. And this is, as it is well known, because uh, I, I assume that everybody made a classical, uh, the studied the Kepler's laws in classical mechanics uh, textbooks. Uh, this is an integrable problem, which means that uh, one can give the exact solution of uh, the two-body problem, Earth, Sun, and uh, we know that by Kepler's laws uh, that in this approximation, the, the motion of the Earth around the Sun is an ellipse where the Sun is located in one focus. So how do we uh, uh, rephrase uh, this sentence uh, that we have an integrable problem, that we can express it as an ellipse uh, in terms of a Hamiltonian formalism? It is given in, in this way, that is, uh, the Hamiltonian function depends just on the actions. It is uh, a function which depends just on j, j are the actions. So this means that uh, by Hamilton's equations that j dot, which is equal to dh over d phi, is equal to zero, so j is a constant. So this means that uh, we have an, a constant, uh, an integrable problem. But uh, what happens if we go to the three-body problem? So we add an extra body. We want to have good models. Uh, so the two-body model in the, in the, is not uh, very accurate in many physical situations. Uh, so, for example, for the Earth, we need to include Jupiter, which is the biggest planet of the solar system. So we go from the two to the three-body problem, and it is, as it was shown by Poincaré, this problem is non-integrable. So the, one cannot give uh, an exact solution of the three-body problem, like it is done for the two-body problem. So this is, uh, the, the, this is uh, uh, let me say also, the beauty of this problem because it generated a long the, the series of results, not only in the fields of, field of celestial mechanics, but motivated the many other theories, as I will say later. And in this case, uh, the Hamiltonian function is given by an integrable part, uh, which corresponds to the Sun-Earth interaction, plus uh, the perturbation due to Jupiter. So we, we, use, we call it epsilon times a perturbing function, which depends both on the actions and the, uh, and the angles. And epsilon here is a small parameter, which is 10 to the minus 3. 
in reality. Okay, so we cannot have uh, uh, an exact result, but uh, we can use perturbation theory to have an approximate solution, like Delaunay did, and beside perturbation theory, we can also use uh, the development uh, which were given after the uh, 19th, uh, the 18th and 19th century, that is uh, kolmogorov arnold moser theory and Nekoroshe theorem. What is the difference between perturbation theory, Nekoroshe theorem, and KM theory? For our purposes and for the purposes of this talk, uh, the main difference is the following. Perturbation theory gives re stability results on finite times of the order of some years. And I will give an application to the space debris problem. Nicolosche theorem gives results on exponentially long times. And I will give an example to the satellite dynamics. And KM theory provides results in some situations on infinite time. And I will give uh, an application to the so-called spin orbit problem. So this summarizes the content of my talk. First, perturbation theory with an application to the space debris. Very briefly, Nekoroshe theorem to satellite dynamics and KM theory, the spin orbit problem. So let me start uh, with the first chapter, which is uh, the one in perturbation theory and the space debris. So the, I don't know if uh, it is known to everybody that the Earth, uh, the sky around the Earth is full of garbage. Uh, uh, that is uh, remnants uh, which are due to, to which uh, the, 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 there have been thousands of satellites launched in the sky since uh, the Sputnik 1 in 1957. And nowadays it is estimated by ESA that uh, there are in the sky about uh, 36,500 objects greater than 10 centimeters, <laughs> 1 million objects between 1 and 10 centimeters, and 130 million objects between 1 millimeter and 1 centimeter. So you could say, say that a one millimeter object is a very tiny object, so like dust, but this is not the case because the high velocity impact is able to, to provoke uh, big dangers, so for example, in the shields of the International Space Station and therefore put in danger the life of the astronauts inside. Um, there are many, there is many garbage around the Earth, up to 2,000 kilometers where most of these satellites are located. Um, but in this, uh, in this region, around the Earth, uh, up to 2,000 kilometers of altitude, there is the effect of the atmosphere. So it is a dissipative dynamical system, let's say. So the, for the moment, uh, the, the, we have results also in that region, but uh, for the rest of this talk, I will concentrate on uh, what happens outside uh, 2,000 kilometers. Uh, so in the so-called uh, medium Earth orbits and geostationary orbits, uh, where we can find also a lot of satellites. Uh, geostationary satellites, GPS satellites. For example, when you call uh, uh, Google and Dusk for the directions to go to a given position, you, you are connected to a GPS satellite, which is located at about 26,000 kilometers from the Earth. To study this problem, we need to have a good model, a good theory, and some applications. So the model is given by the so-called geolunisolar model which consists of uh, different components. The Earth, the Keplerian attraction, but then uh, we cannot uh, disregard the fact that the Earth is not spherical. It has its own shape. So we need to get to solve Laplace equation and give a shape to the Earth and take an approximation of the shape. This, is, uh, this means that uh, we will need to, uh, uh, at least uh, to consider the most important spherical harmonic coefficients of the potential of the Earth, which are called J2 and J3. And then we include also Sun and Moon, which will be treated as third body perturbations, whose role is also very important. Mathematical theories, in this part, we will take just perturbation theory. Why perturbation theory? Because it will allow us to compute normal forms and the normal forms which will allow to introduce some elements which are called proper elements. I will define them in a moment, but let me say that these are quasi-integrals of motion. So they will be very useful. Um, 
and we will analyze, uh, we analyze uh, this, uh, these proper elements by means of statistical techniques and also machine learning methods. I, I will show the application of uh, machine learning. And finally, uh, the results uh, to applications. Uh, the results will, gi will give uh, stability of the fragments uh, after generated after a collision or an explosion. And also, one important point is that uh, these mathematical methods uh, will allow us uh, to reconnect uh, the fragment uh, to the parent body. So we, we look at a, an explosion, for example, we see the fragments after 10 years, and then for the, we will be able to reconnect uh, the fragments uh, to the body that generated the explosion, which I think is a very nice application. So um, I don't want to enter the details of the model because it is a quite complex Hamiltonian which depends on different uh, uh, contributions which are the, the action angle variables of the space debris, the fragment, the action angle variables of the moon, the sun, and it depends also on the sidereal time. The sidereal time is uh, the angle of rotation of the earth. Uh, the, earth the earth is rotating, so we need also this angle. And of course, uh, these action angle variables are related to the orbital elements, and uh, we will focus on the semi-major axis A, the eccentricity E, and the inclination I. So this is a complex Hamiltonian depending on several variables. What uh, we need to know now is that uh, the, the, the main difficulty in this Hamiltonian it, is that uh, it, it um, includes uh, variables uh, which depend on different time scales. So we have uh, fast uh, angles, which are the angle of rotation of the debris, the angle of rotation of the Earth, or periods of one day or some days, semi-fast angles, which are the motion of the Moon with period of one month, or the Sun with period of one year, and then we have also slow angles, which give the orientation of the orbits in space. The so-called, the astronomers call the, these angles the argument of perigee, and the longitude of the ascending node, which are give the orientation of the orbit with respect to a fixed frame, and this vary with periods of several years. So this is a difficulty because uh, when implementing perturbation theory, we need to take into account that we have different time scales. What is perturbation theory? It is given here. It is just in one slide. I just quickly. Uh, let's say, uh, describe the content of the theory. Um, again, uh, we start uh, with a nearly integrable Hamiltonian, Z of J, the integrable part, plus the perturbation epsilon R. We assume that R is, a, we expand uh, R like Delaunay did uh, in a uh, uh, Taylor uh, Fourier ex series, and we take a finite number of coefficients, Fourier coefficients. Then we, we define the frequency omega as uh, the derivative of the integrable part uh, with respect to the actions. And we assume that this frequency is uh, non-resonant, which means that uh, omega dot k is greater than zero, and it suffices to have that k is uh, an integer vector less or equal than n. So these are very general conditions. Uh, and uh, if uh, these conditions are satisfied, uh, then we can find uh, a change of coordinates from the variables j phi to new variables j prime phi prime, a canonical change of coordinates, which transforms uh, the original Hamiltonian into this Hamiltonian, z prime of j prime, so an integrable part, plus epsilon square r prime. So this is uh, an integrable Hamiltonian up to orders of epsilon square. And of course, uh, under certain conditions, we could go on to epsilon cube, epsilon to the fourth, and so on. So why is this uh, nice? Uh, th 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 this is nice because uh, while here we have an integrable system up to order epsilon, for example, 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 4, here we have something which is integrable up to epsilon square. So epsilon to the minus six or epsilon to the minus eight, which is much better. And how do we use it? We use it in this way. So once we obtain the normal form, that is uh, the, the integrable part up to orders epsilon square, we observe that if we neglect orders of epsilon square, then the new actions J prime are constant for this Hamiltonian Z prime. So they are nearly constant for the full Hamiltonian. Even more, perturbation theory is a constructive theory, 
So we can write explicitly the canonical transformation. We can back transform to the original variables, which are those that uh, the astronomers, astronomers observe. And we define in this way the proper elements. So the proper elements are these quasi-integrals of motion, which are back transformed into the original variables. These uh, proper elements uh, are not new. They were introduced in 1918 by Hirayama, and uh, he used it already for asteroid families. So the, the idea of uh, Hirayama was uh, uh, assume that uh, we observe uh, different asteroids, uh, and that these asteroids are fragments uh, generated uh, by the breakup of uh, a larger body, not a planet, uh, but a larger a planetoid. Hmm? So um, can we? associate uh, these fragments uh, to the same family? The answer is yes, and the tool is, uh, was uh, at that time uh, the introduction of these proper elements. So this, uh, this was uh, the starting point, and the idea is not new. The newest part was uh, the application to the space debris, which has uh, the, pro the, the difficulty, as I was saying before, that uh, we have different time scales, and therefore we need to implement a hierarchical perturbation theory. In the end, uh, we end up uh, with the different definitions of the elements, which are the proper elements that I introduced before. Then we have uh, the osculating elements, which are those that astronomers observe. And then we also have the mean elements. Uh, the mean elements are the orbital elements, uh, which are obtained uh, when we take the Hamiltonian and we just average over the fast variables. Uh, so the sidereal time and uh, the mean anomaly, the, the, angle of, uh, uh, the orbital angle of the space debris. In particular, we will compare proper elements uh, to mean elements, which is easier than uh, osculating elements. Then we have another difficulty. The other difficulty is that uh, while for asteroids, uh, there are many data which are given by astronomers. Uh, so the astronomers observe the sky and give uh, the positions of the, aster of the asteroids. Uh, for space debris, there are very few data. Uh, imagine to observe a one millimeter object uh, and follow over time uh, to get the families of a one millimeter object. Uh, this is very difficult. So, so we needed to have something, uh, our experimental data. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, we needed to make uh, a simulator of breakup events. And uh, this is a long standing project that we started in 2020. And uh, we realized, after four years, uh, we realized a simulator of breakup events, either collision and an explosion, based on a very short paper, less than 15 pages, uh, of, by NASA, uh, with uh, the, the model Evolve 4.0. So based on that model, we developed our own simulator, which do does the following two things. One is um, to simulate uh, a breakup event, uh, uh, from given input data, the orbital elements, uh, the, the size of the generated fragments, uh, and then uh, we give uh, the, uh, the fragments, all the fragments, and the, also data analysis for each fragment. And the other one is a propagation. So simulation plus propagation. This is why we call it uh, SIMPRO. Propagation of the orbit means uh, we select the model, we select uh, the formalism, and we are able to give uh, the, the orbital elements over time. This is a, a screenshot of the simulator, which is done in uh, collaboration with Mario Sapetri, Catalin Galesh, Tudor Bartolomei, and Christos Eftimiopoulos. And uh, we want to release uh, the executable file for free as soon as the accompanying paper will be accepted, and I hope it will be done in the next few weeks or months. So um, in this way, everybody will be able to simulate uh, either a single breakup event simulate multiple breakup events and propagate orbits. Let me give an example of what can be done with this simulator. Uh, this is uh, the content of this paper with uh, Giuseppe Pucacco and Tudor Bartolomei. So um, we simulated a breakup event, generated fragments, computed the orbital elements for each fragment, computed the mean and uh, proper elements, and then we compared uh, the mean and proper elements at different times. So up to now, everything is uh, uh, not, uh, ex maybe not extremely clear, because I need to now to give an application. And the application is given here. So hopefully, you will uh, uh, 
understand that, uh, or I, I will be able to, to, to transmit to you that uh, this is a very powerful tool. So this, uh, this is a, a, a breakup, of a collision between a spacecraft and the projectile, and these are the fragments. These are the fragments at the initial time, the mean elements at the initial time, after 60 years, 120 years, and 180 years. On the, in the space, uh, semi-major axis, eccentricity and inclination. Those on the first row, in red, are the mean elements, and below you have the proper elements, so the outcome of perturbation theory. We analyzed uh, these groups of fragments uh, by means of statistical analysis, for example, Pearson correlation coefficient, Kolmogorov uh, mean of test, but even by eye inspection, you immediately recognize that uh, the proper elements uh, keep the same shape over time. These are quasi-integrals. While the mean elements, uh, you see, that get dispersed over time. So this means that uh, you can, uh, if, you, if you observe uh, this configuration, for example, the mean elements, uh, the proper elements after 180 years, uh, you are able to say that uh, the body that generated the fragment is exactly this one because it is uh, the same distribution of the proper elements, which is not the case uh, with the mean elements. So we did it uh, for practical applications for which uh, some, some satellites for which data were available and it is very successful. We can also use machine learning methods. Machine learning methods, uh, and this is, uh, for example, the explosion of two satellites of Molniya type at different altitudes. Uh, Semi-major axis 15,000 and 30,000 kilometers, and then nearby initial conditions. So the, one is, the, the, the first uh, breakup is in red, the second one is in blue, and then uh, we have here a clusterization method. A clusterization method is a k-means, so it is a supervised machine learning method, which is a centroid-based machine learning method. We let the machine identify the clusters, and the clusters are those in light blue or light orange. So a superposition between red and orange or light blue and blue means that uh, the clusterization was fine. And for example, it is not fine here, 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 this one, and also this one and this one. So the machine was able to recognize all the fragments except uh, seven of them. And this is uh, at the initial time, and even after 50 years, uh, it was very successful. But, uh, and this is why I was saying at the beginning, uh, I'm very careful in uh, uh, using these methods uh, for the moment uh, because uh, one could use uh, k-means, which is a supervised uh, machine learning method, but uh, one could use also other methods. Uh, machine learning methods uh, like uh, uh, here is uh, DBSCAN, which performs well, but a Gaussian mixture, for example, identifies uh, three groups, uh, while the satellites were two. So this, uh, the, one needs uh, really to, to understand better which are the good methods uh, to make uh, this clusterization. So this is an example. This is a clusterization. Later I will give also a classification method. What can be done in the, in the future? At least here are some directions of work, uh, like, um, well, introduce resonant proper element, uh, which is an ongoing work of my two younger collaborators, uh, Docas and Bartolomei. Include uncertainty in noise. This is a crucial point because data in astronomy are never precise. So they need uh, to, to include uncertainty in noise, include the dissipative effects uh, to, to, get, uh, to, to be in LEO in the, uh, at low altitudes, uh, implement machine learning methods uh, to classify or even predict. And this uh, could allow us uh, to identify graveyard orbits where satellites can be placed at the end of their operative life or even to extend to other problems like uh, ring dynamics or galactic dynamics, which can be treated as uh, um, uh, clusters of uh, fragments uh, like the space debris. Let me briefly give now some example, the one example in the dish, very uh, few words about the Nekoroshe theorem. The Nekoroshe theorem is given here, the statement is given here. Again, it is based on perturbation theory, at least in the non resonant case, uh, when we take uh, the frequency non-resonant. Uh, but the, the, the conclusion is different uh, in the sense that uh, the conclusion says that uh, the action variables uh, 
stay bounded for an exponentially long time. So this is a very powerful theorem because it goes from not order epsilon square, so you don't have results, stability results of the order of time of one over epsilon square, but it gives results of the order of time of e to the one over epsilon to some power b. b is one over two n. Indeed, Little Wood was saying that I, though this is not eternity, it is a considerable slice of it, except to having exponential times. And what is the application? The application of this theorem is given in this work with Irene de Blas and Christos F. Timiopoulos, where we consider the satellite, a single body, so either a fragment or a satellite around the Earth, again with the Geoluri solar model, which is composed by the Keplerian, the, the, the spherical harmonic coefficients of the Earth, Sun and Moon, and we implemented we treated, uh, we prepared the Hamiltonian before implementing Nicolas' theorem by averaging over fast variables, expanding around some reference values, uh, and normalizing, uh, imp implementing perturbation theory. In this way, we end up uh, with uh, a Hamiltonian function with two degrees of freedom, and uh, we can implement a very nice paper by Jürgen Peschel, 1993, uh, of Nicolas theorem, which works for quasi-convex Hamiltonians, and indeed it gives uh, stability estimates uh, over exponentially long times uh, for different values of the orbital elements. And the results are given here. Are given here at different altitudes, uh, 11,000, 14,000, 18,000, and 19,000 kilometers of altitude. So the satellite is located at different uh, uh, distances from the Earth. Here is uh, the inclination between 0 and 90 degrees, the eccentricity between 0 and 0 0.5, and then the time is given on a color scale. Well, if you go closer to the moon, uh, the, the, the white part is uh, the, the part where the theorem cannot be applied uh, because you are getting closer and closer to the moon. But at smaller altitudes, uh, like uh, 11,000 kilometers uh, for the semi-major axis, uh, you obtain stability times uh, which are not of order of uh, some years, but of order of 1,000 years, 32,000 years. The yellow part, uh, for example, this one, for, this, uh, for all the eccentricities uh, and uh, inclination, for example, uh, if, if, uh, 20 degrees. So this is, uh, this is uh, a, a different application of perturbation theory and an extension of a very powerful theorem. But I don't have time to spend uh, the, the more words on this because I would like to go now to the next session. But before doing, saying that, I, that again, I, I see several lines of uh, direction of uh, these uh, applications of Nicolas theorem for the future. Um, uh, for example, to treat, uh, to, to make uh, the non resonant case of Nicolas theorem. And also, the one important point is. Uh, to, to see whether Nicolas theorem works also in dissipative systems, so which is nothing which is, uh, as far as I know, it is not known in the literature. And now let me come to the final part, uh, KM theory and the spin orbit problem. So um, KM theory, the, it is a theorem which was developed by Kolmogorov, Arnold and Moser between 1954 and 1963. And uh, it studies quasi-periodic motions in unintegrable dynamical systems, and in particular, the persistence of invariant tori in nearly integrable systems. So it's Hamiltonians like Z plus epsilon R. But it works also in dissipative systems. In fact, uh, uh, it, uh, there is a very nice paper by Moser in 1967, which treats uh, uh, non-Hamiltonian perturbations. And later, there are also works by Brewer, Simo, and other authors. In 2013, uh, together with uh, Renato Calleja and Rafael de la Llave, we developed an efficient KM theory for a class of uh, dissipative systems, which are called uh, conformally symplectic systems. I must say that uh, here I work with uh, uh, finite degrees of freedom and low degrees of freedom, and I will give an application to low degrees of freedom, but this theory can be expanded also to PDEs, and we have uh, here an expert uh, of the application of KM theory, so, but uh, we, I will stay with uh, low degrees of freedom. So I refer to Massimiliano for applications to PDs. So uh, in any case, uh, the application will be given to the spin orbit problem, which is a low dimensional system. 
Uh, but the main point that I would like to highlight is that uh, it will be a dissipative system, which is the novelty, let's say, of the last few uh, years in the applications of KM theory. What are the, the assumptions under which uh, this theory can be implemented? A, K, a diophantine condition that is a, a strong non-resonance condition and the suitable non-degeneracy condition on the Hamiltonian. So I will be more precise in a moment. Let me give an example. An example in order to fix the ideas of what is the content of the theorem. So we, we analyze this uh, simple discrete uh, system, uh, which is uh, called uh, the standard map, uh, the Chirikov standard map. It is uh, given by a discrete system from yx to y prime x prime on the cylinder, given by these simple equations. And you see that if we take epsilon equal to zero, we obtain an integrable system. Y prime is equal to y, it's constant. And therefore, we obtain that uh, if we take uh, a given initial condition, we stay on a straight line corresponding to the given y. x is between zero and two pi. So this is the situation for epsilon equal to zero. All of these are KM invariant rotational tori, which are the object of study of KM theory. What happens if we increase the perturbation? Epsilon equal to 0 0.3, we see periodic orbits, rotational tori, uh, and the elaborational tori. And if we increase uh, epsilon, we obtain uh, chaotic motions and uh, elaborational tori of higher amplitudes. And you see that uh, there are less and less uh, invariant rotational KM tori, which are object of study that uh, we, we want to uh, prove the existence of this tori. But at a certain point, uh, when we increase epsilon, we reach a value at which uh, there are no more invariant tori. Huh? If we look, for example, at epsilon equal to one, we don't see uh, any more invariant tori. We can fix the frequency. For example, we can say, let's say that uh, this is the frequency of the golden ratio, the red one. Uh, one the golden ratio is 1.618. And uh, we could wonder what is the value at which that specific invariant torus with that frequency equal to the golden ratio breaks down. This is the crucial question of KM theory. Uh, let me skip this part. Let me say that uh, the theorem gives an answer, a constructive method, to say the torus equal with frequency equal to the golden ratio exists up to this value of epsilon. Or we can generalize, and not for the standard map, but we can say for the three-body problem there exists an invariant torus for epsilon less or equal than a given threshold. And now the main question is, uh, how big is this threshold given by the theorem? The main point is that uh, in, in, when uh, the, the, the first application, which was given in the 60s uh, uh, by Michel Non, who was a, a very good mathematician uh, at the Observatory of Nice, uh, who gave me his computation in person when I was visiting Nice, uh, and it was called, the, the content was given in one page. Uh, the estimate in the end was uh, epsilon should be less or equal than 10 to the minus 50 while uh, uh, for the three-body problem, while the mass of Jupiter is 10 to the minus three. So they, this uh, would mean to replace uh, Jupiter with a proton and say that uh, the, the Earth is stable under the attraction of Sun and the proton. So for a long time it was uh, believed that uh, KM theory was a nice theory but uh, with uh, no physical applications. Uh, and in more recent times, uh, there have been many other applications of uh, KM theory to physical problems and problems of celestial mechanics uh, where we can say that yes, it gives, uh, the theorem gives results which are fully consistent with the astronomical observation or even with the experimental value. If you don't have a, 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 a astronomical applications, so you can compute uh, the breakdown threshold by means of numerical integrations, for example. So I call it the uh, experimental value. How do we obtain these uh, this, uh, uh, applications? Well, we implement uh, the theorem. We implement the theorem that is, uh, which allows us to reduce uh, uh, the existence of the invariant theory to finding solution of a, a, of a specific uh, functional equation. Then if we have an approximate solution which satisfies uh, some non-degeneracy conditions, uh, 
one can get an approximate solution, not to order epsilon square epsilon cube, but uh, with the Newton's method. So epsilon square, epsilon to the four, epsilon to the eight, uh, 16, and so on. And uh, prove the convergence of this method, uh, of the Newton's iteration method. Uh, and in order to have applications, uh, we need to use a computer. And to get rid of the error introduced by the computer, we need to have to implement uh, suitable methods like uh, interval arithmetic, uh, which gives uh, computer-assisted proofs. In particular, in what follows, uh, we will use uh, this uh, method, uh, which was originally developed by Rafael de la Llave and collaborators, uh, de la Llave, González, Jorba, Villanueva, which makes use of the a posterior approach plus uh, uh, automatic reducibility. We did it uh, in, uh, in, for the spin orbit problem. We did it uh, for, the, um, for the dissipative system. Now I need to, be, to, to, I need to be a little bit more technical because I need to introduce uh, which kind of dissipative system are we going to study. And these are called conformally symplectic systems, uh, which are special systems uh, such that uh, they, they satisfy the following definition, that is, uh, for example, for a maps, mapping system, for a discrete system, we have uh, assumed that we have a family of maps f mu, depending also on a drift parameter mu. So I, I forgot to say the following, which is a, a very important point. When we pass uh, from the conservative uh, to the dissipative KN theory, there is an extra difficulty that is uh, due to the fact that uh, we need to introduce a drift parameter, extra parameters, uh, to compensate uh, the loss of energy. So we cannot uh, uh, analyze the standard map as it was before, but uh, we need to introduce uh, a parameter mu, which compensates the loss of energy. So this drift parameter, so this is why we start uh, with the family F mu of maps, which are called uh, conformally symplectic if uh, they satisfy this relation, that is the pullback of F mu applied to omega is equal to lambda omega. This is the definition of symplectic system when lambda is equal to one, conformally symplectic system when lambda is uh, less than one, uh, different from zero. Which means that, uh, what is the physical interpretation? It means that uh, the map contracts the symplectic form always by the same rate, which is called lambda. So this is a special class of uh, dissipative systems. You could have a dissipative system which expand and contract. No, we are always going in the same direction. Then we need uh, the Diophantine condition. The Diophantine condition, the technical definition is given here. Well, it is a well-known uh, inequality. I don't want to enter the, into the technical details. I just want to say the following. Why in perturbation theory? We assume that uh, omega dot q was greater than zero, that's all. In KM theory, we need uh, a stronger condition, which is called the Diophantine condition, which tells you that uh, omega dot q is far from a strip, so it's bigger than CQ to the minus tau, which is greater than zero. So this condition implies uh, the non resonance condition, but it is stronger than uh, the non resonance condition. Okay, so next, uh, we introduce uh, the notion of a KM torus for a family of maps uh, F mu, which is conformally symplectic, with the often that we fix a often time frequency omega, and we say that uh, a KM torus is a n-dimensional invariant torus, uh, which is described parametrically by an embedding K and the drift mu, which satisfies the following invariance equation, which is the centerpiece of KM theory. That is F mu composed with K of theta is equal to K of theta plus omega. Well, this, uh, this means that in these uh, parametric coordinates, theta, the flow is linear. So it, theta goes uh, to theta plus omega. We want to give explicit estimates. Uh, so we need to introduce a norm to measure the different uh, quantities. Uh, and one possible norm is that of analytic functions, which is given here. So with these uh, technical definitions, which are unavoidable if one wants to give uh, the statement of the theorem, we pass uh, to these slides, uh, which is uh, an approximate version of the statement of the KN theory for conformally symplectic systems. So for this uh, kind of dissipative systems, which says that uh, if we have uh, 
uh, a family of maps f mu, conformally symplectic, if we fix omega diophantine. If we have an approximate solution, let's say k0 mu0, which satisfies the invariance equation with an error term e0, which we assume to be sufficient small so that uh, the solution is uh, sufficiently approximate. If we have some non degeneracy conditions, which are very technical and I would take uh, one or two more slides, so let me skip them, then there exists an exact solution which satisfies exactly the invariance equation, say k star mu star, and beside that uh, we know that uh, the exact solution is close to the initial one because k star minus k0 as well less than mu star minus mu0 as ba are bounded by the initial error. So this is the statement of the theorem. What is the important point uh, behind uh, this uh, statement? Uh, the statement is that, uh, the important point is that, uh, like in perturbation theory, KM theory gives a constructive algorithm. So it gives, uh, step by step, uh, a procedure to compute the value of epsilon, which ensures the existence of a given invariant torus. Nevertheless, the, the, this algorithm, this KM algorithm, implies quite long computations, which cannot do easily by hand. So typically, one implements, a, one uses a computer, especially if one wants to have an application to the three-body problem or to the spin-orbit problem. But as you know, the computer introduces uh, a rounding of errors, uh, right? And propagation errors. Uh. So if you compute uh, with a computer one over three, it will be 0 0.3333 if it has uh, four digits of precision. And then it will also have, uh, beside the rounding off, it will have propagation errors. Uh. Nevertheless, uh, these, pro these errors uh, introduced by the computer can be controlled uh, by means of the so-called interval arithmetic technique. I don't want to spend more, many words, but it means that uh, one replaces uh, the real number by an interval. So instead of 0 0.333, you take 0 0.32 or 0 0.34, which contains 1 over 3. And then you develop an algebra over, of the intervals instead of real numbers. So this is a very powerful technique which provides you with a computer-assisted proof, CAP. It is a, a very powerful method, but it is also somehow time-consuming to make, to transform a program into a program with interval arithmetic. So another possibility is to obtain not a proof, but a computer-assisted validation. So you make uh, your computations with uh, a computer b b using, per, for example, MPFR, and you take uh, 100 digits. So this is not a proof, uh, but it is a validation. So what are the, the, the applications of uh, KM theory to celestial mechanics? Uh, they are summarized here in this table. I included also the standard map, uh, the conservative standard map uh, for which I was showing some graphs. Uh, these uh, were the very uh, initial works uh, that uh, De La Jave made uh, with Rana or I made uh, with Luigi Kierkia in the 90s. Uh, and and uh, here we reached uh, not 100%. Uh, the, the, the goal is to obtain 100% of the experimental value or 100% of the astronomical value. But uh, we were able to reach uh, first 86, then 93. But here in, the, in 2016, uh, there is uh, this nice paper by Figuera Saruluke where for the conservative standard map as well as uh, other models, they reached 99.9% .9 of uh, the experimental value. So the KM theory is able to state uh, the result of the existence of an invariant torus with a given frequency up to 99.9% .9 of the experimental value. So this is why I was saying uh, nowadays uh, it can be used also for practical applications. What about uh, uh, um, celestial mechanics? Uh, here are different problems, the spin-orbit problem, the three-body problem, the planetary problem with different authors. Uh, and uh, we obtain in all cases 100% uh, of consistency with uh, the astronomical observations. In the dissipative case, we have up to now two examples, the standard map and the spin orbit problem. Again, results are very close to the experimental value. So the theorem is very powerful. 
let me give the application to the dissipative uh, spin orbit problem, which is the last part. Um, so the, the, let me say in a few words, uh, this is the motion of a satellite, for example, the moon around the Earth, uh, with the moon being a triaxial body, moving around, uh, the, way, around the shortest physical axis, uh, and uh, with the center of mass uh, moving on a Keplerian ellipse uh, around uh, the, the Earth. So this is a simplifying assumption in such a way that the model is reduced to this uh, second order different, ordinary differential equation, which is uh, in, the, in the angle x, uh, which provides uh, the orientation of the moon, the, ax the, the rotation axis of the moon with respect to a fixed line. So this is a second order differential equation and uh, uh, equal to zero in the conservative case or equal to a function let's say eta times f of x dot and t, which is a linear function of the velocity in the dissipative case. What does the dissipation mean? The dissipation in this case is due to the fact that uh, the moon, like all other bodies of the solar system, uh, are not rigid, exactly rigid. So there is uh, a non-rigidity, and the non-rigidity gives uh, a tidal torque. And the tidal torque uh, can be modeled by a linear function of the velocity. And since it is a linear function of the velocity, the system is conformally symplectic. And we are happy because we can use the KM theory for conformally symplectic systems. Let me also say that if we disregard the dissipation, we obtain a one-dimensional 10-dependent Hamiltonian function. And in this case, the phase space is three-dimensional, y, x, and t. So this means that two-dimensional invariant tori separate the phase space. And this is why, uh, and this means that every orbit which is in between, like this one, will be forever trapped between the invariant tori, providing therefore stability for infinite times. So KM theory provides stability in the sense of, for infinite times, in the sense of confinement of the motion between two invariant tori, like being in this room, eh? between the, the seal and the floor, everything will be inside and cannot go uh, up or down, seal and floor. Well, this, uh, in this way, uh, one can use uh, this property to, to uh, produce results about the stability of the, of the moon. And uh, this dates back to my PhD thesis. Um, so long time ago, and, uh, a, and I was able to make a computer-assisted uh, proof uh, proving the stability of the, the, the moon for the real values of the moon. That is the true eccentricity, the true value of epsilon for the moon, that is, uh, which means uh, the equatorial blackness of the moon. For the dissipative case, the dissipative case is a joint work with uh, Renato Calleja, uh, Jean Guimain, and Rafael de la Llave. And here, again, uh, the, the statement is exactly the same as I was showing before, and uh, it gives uh, uh, results for a given value of the dissipation, gives results for epsilon equal to 0 0.0116. So what is in this case uh, the experimental value? The experimental value is given here, 116.329. So you see that uh, the, also here the KM theory is extremely close uh, to the uh, experimental value. So the analytical result is true, close to the experimental value. The last two slides, uh, an application of machine learning to this problem, to the conservative spin orbit problem. This is done here in scientific reports with uh, Galesh, Rodriguez, Fernandez, and Vasile, where we consider the spin orbit problem. We trained uh, the machine to distinguish between uh, chaotic rotation and labration of motion and this architecture, we used inception time, which is a convolutional neural network with five layers. What does it mean? It means that uh, we used uh, some chaos indicators, uh, fast Lyapunov indicators, frequency map analysis, assigned the label zero for chaotic motions, one for vibrational motions, two for rotational KM tori. We trained the machine on a given number of orbits, we validated, and then we asked the machine to predict the motion. And this was very successful because it filled all this part here, including the KM tori, 
which overlaps with uh, what, uh, the, what is the, the numerical integration, let's say, that uh, we can have uh, integrating the, the, the equations of motion. So the machine was able to predict the motion and uh, fill uh, the pa this Pankare map. Uh, and even more, let me say the last, the la last result, uh, we uh, took uh, an approximation of the spin orbit problem with uh, the perturbing function with just two harmonics. And then we wanted to predict the motion of the perturbing function with six harmonics. Hmm? In this case, uh, Delaunay would have been very happy because, uh, they, 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 as I was saying before, his uh, perturbing function was uh, 22 pages long, so with many, many harmonics. So this is, uh, these are the results. So we trained for a given value of epsilon, we trained with two harmonics, uh, and then we let the machine predict uh, the results with six harmonics. And the prediction is uh, almost 98% of accuracy reached uh, for this value of the eccentricity, 10 to the minus two, in accuracy and performance, uh, which decreases uh, up to about uh, 87%, if I remember well, for eccentricity 0 0.09, which is a nice result uh, because, uh, of course, it can be used uh, in practical applications. Again, we have many directions to explore. KN theory for dissipative systems different than conformally symplectic, higher dimensional models, uh, converse KN theory, so providing uh, not uh, lower estimates but upper bounds on the non-existence of uh, KM theory for dissipative systems, and also an application of machine learning techniques uh, to dissipative systems. So I think uh, my time is over, so I, I stop here, providing the references of these uh, three parts, uh, perturbation theory and space debris, the work on Nicolaschet theorem and satellite dynamics, uh, and the final part on the application of KM theory to the spin orbit problem. So I thank you very much for your attention, and I'm ready to take questions, if any. So thank you very much, Alexander. It was an excellent talk. I learned a lot from it. So any comment or questions? <laughs> Hello, thank you. I'm Carlo Bacigalupi, uh, coordinator of the PhD in astrophysics and cosmology. I'm uh, fascin fascinated by this, uh, by this topic, and uh, let me let me try to approach a, a, a more, more of the applications of these, uh, of these theories. So we are living in an epoch in which, in which we, um, we, we assist to a, a, an unbelievable increase of uh, flying objects uh, in, uh, in the low orbit, for example, like Starlink satellites, etc. At this moment, I think 70,000 satellites are orbiting only for the Starlink uh, processes. So that means that we have two, two satellites per square degrees at each time. So, do you, are you, and, and also in other celestial bodies like the Moon and Mars, we are expecting to have populations of things increasing. So, what are in your perspective the applications of your, your theories and, and treatments to this, uh, to this growth of, uh, of relevance for these topics? Okay, maybe I can, uh, I can answer from this microphone. So, thank you very much for this, que for this question. It is very interesting, of course. Well, First, uh, let me say the following. When I, when I make this kind of talks, uh, which is not specific in on the mathematical part or rather on the application, the difficulty is to give uh, the flavor of all the three ingredients. Uh, that is, uh, we have a mathematical theory which is serious, which is very important, like KM theory or perturbation theory. We have models, but models have to be complemented, for example, by our simulator. And then we have applications uh, which are like the space debris, which is something which is uh, not uh, well considered by, by, by nation, by gover governments. So um, there are different ingredients. But the question is uh, more specific on the mathematical model. Let me do the, the make another consideration first. Uh, there are too many satellites in the sky at the moment. And uh, the, uh, the risk uh, that uh, there is a, a, a problem uh, in the future is very high. Are we prepared 
to have uh, uh, mitigation actions or to, to have uh, a safeguard uh, actions so in case of collisions or explosions? The answer is very often no. We have seen in the past uh, there will be a satellite coming back uh, from the Earth. Uh, well, the strip is uh, Italy. Okay, it can, it can go out, uh, in, it can go down, and the strip is uh, the whole Italy or the whole region with the whole. Uh, the, wool, the size of a wool region, it can go on, on, the, on the earth in any place of a given region. So we don't have, uh, uh, it is very difficult to predict uh, where the satellites will go on, will, will end up their life. But even more, um, there are too many satellites uh, which are launched in the sky and people launch without knowing what they will do at the end of the operative life, which is extremely important because if they leave them in the sky, sooner or later they will give um, a concrete action to what is called the Kessler syndrome. Kessler was a, 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 a collaborator of NASA who said that there, there are so many satellites in the sky that sooner or later the space era will stop because we will not be able to go out of our sky. So what is uh, missing? Now we have some, we have mathematical models, we have theories, we can use them, but we need also to have an interaction with governments, with space agencies, to have uh, rules. This is extremely important. We have. Uh, uh, theories in order to give, uh, to say these are good regions uh, or we are going in that direction to say which are the good regions, but now we need regulations. So in my opinion, the, the most important point uh, will be that scientists uh, will speak uh, with uh, uh, people that decide uh, where the, the satellites are, where and when the satellites are launched. Okay. So any other question, comment? First of all, thanks a lot for this very nice survey. Can you explain more uh, the use of uh, machine learning methods, uh, for example, for collecting fragments, uh, the first part, because I actually have no idea of uh, sure. how you would uh, do. What uh, would you do? Yes. Um, so in the, in the case, uh, we, we are working a lot on the case of the space debris, and the direction of the machine learning could be either to make clusters or to make predictions, uh, classification. So clusterization and uh, classification. As I was saying before starting the talk to Tamara, um, um, I think that there are lights and shadows in machine learning, and especially what I, I and my group of people, collaborators, would like to do is uh, to do our own programs in order to see whether, uh, in order to see, for example, to have a clusterization. After all, machine learning is uh, programming, making programs. So we are able to make our own programs, not using black box, I don't want to cite any of the black boxes which are nowadays used, but we do our own, uh, which is an added value, let's say, because we are going slow, but we are uh, confident in our methods. What does it mean, a clusterization of debris? Okay, so what uh, does it mean? It means, uh, for example, in this case, uh, I was uh, showing uh, one example. Uh, so first of all, we use uh, our own simulator. That was another point that uh, we, we, we needed to do, even if we are not uh, uh, space engineers, uh, but uh, we need our own simulator, which is this one. We make uh, the, the fragmentation, for example, the, the, we take uh, the, the simulator, the fragmentation between uh, uh, two satellites here, which are the red and the blue one, and the red and blue one generate fragments. And if you have fragments, uh, you look at, at the initial time, at, at the time of breakup, and you look at uh, after many years, uh, 50 years. Uh, and you want to see, uh, and then you, you ask the machine to identify which are the red and the blue fragments. This is the clusterization. So you can use uh, different methods. Uh, 
K-means is uh, one of the standard methods, but it is an algorithm in, num in numerical analysis. So it, it, it identifies, uh, first, it gives a guess to the centroid of the two clusters, computes the distances of the fragments from the centroid, uh, computes some quantities to say whether it is uh, correct or not, uh, approximates better the centroid, and goes on. Okay, so this is one method. And k-means is able to identify, you, if you use k-means, you have to say, you have two clusters, you need to identify two clusters. So you give uh, the number of clusters. And you identify the blue and red dots. Okay, so this is a numerical method, uh, and uh, what, is, uh, what does the machine do? You have uh, a, a fragmentation, for example, let me say with uh, 1,000 fragments. So you say, you, you train the machine with uh, 600 fragments. So you know that 600 fragments are blue or red, and you tell the machine that, I, and you let the machine predict what are the remaining 400 fragments. Are they blue or red? Okay, so this is the clusterization. So this is one application. The other one is the classification. The classification is like in the other example that I made, that is uh, you make uh, a libration, rotational, uh, chaotic motion, and you let the machine predict. Did I answer your question? Yes, okay. So some other question, comment, Umberto? Uh, so thank you very much for this very nice talk. <clears throat> so I have actually two questions. So the first one is, uh, so I'm very impressed that uh, uh, these methods are able to reach uh, 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 the epsilon threshold, which is comparable with the uh, astronomical one. So do you think, have you ever uh, thought, or maybe you already done, uh, so, so to try to apply this method also in the, in the world of PDs? So in such a way that one can find uh, KM orbits uh, which are uh, physically visible? For me, the answer is no, I never did it. I don't know if Massimiliano knows explicit uh, KM estimates in PDs. I don't think that uh, it was uh, maybe from the Polish people, Zyglinski or, no, I don't think it was done. Uh, in... nice try, but do yes. you have also, so, I guess you need, so you must have a lot of improvement with respect to partial estimates. Yes, of course, yes. In, in PDs or what? Sorry. Uh, no, also, also, also in, in, in your case. So let, let me rephrase. So do you have a new algorithm to perform the KM step or you are able to compute very explicitly all ah, the constants okay, which enter okay. in so the this schema? is another question. So what is the improvement, uh, the theoretical improvement uh, with which uh, we were able to reach uh, yes. the threshold? Okay, so uh, let me say that there are two, two aspects. Uh, one is uh, the implementation of the computer which has been, we, which changed over the years. Uh, so in the 90s, uh, we, I was making uh, interval arithmetic by, by hand. I was one of the the first people I was, uh, a, my teacher was Oscar Lamford. I was, uh, when I was a PhD student at uh, ETH. And uh, I was doing by hand, that is literally, by, I was using a box machine and I was uh, transforming every number into binary numbers and changing the last bit of the mantissa. So it was done, it was, I mean, a lot of work, but I was younger. So I was uh, spending time in the, doing this work. Nowadays, uh, you can do it in a, in a much faster way, in a better way, um, and computers are much faster. So this is one point that I must say explicitly. But the other point is uh, um, we changed the strategy of proof uh, in KM theory, and that was uh, one improvement uh, which was given by, uh, especially by Rafael de la Llave, a proof uh, which, they, which goes back uh, to his paper. Uh, we discussed after the PISA conference with Massimiliano because uh, uh, that proof uh, is able to give uh, a, a more efficient algorithm. So 
there is an algorithm, and that proof, uh, the proof that uh, was given by the Layaven collaborators uh, gives uh, a very good algorithm. That is, uh, you need a very few steps uh, to reach uh, the approximate solution. You need very few operations in order to have uh, the uh, one of these uh, Newton steps. And this is a technical question which is called uh, automatic reducibility and uh, um, which is in the, in the paper. So it, it, of course it, it can be done also with the other, the traditional method, let's say, the one that uh, we use in the 90s, uh, paying the price of making uh, more computations, uh, but can be done also in both ways. Thank you. For example, let me say, Giorgilli, Locatelli, Sansotera use uh, Kolmogorov normal forms. Uh, so they use a, 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 a another way, a third way, a third algorithm, but they are able to reach 100% in, in several works for the planetary problem, which is even um, more difficult than the tribory problem, the restricted tribory problem. Okay, so some further questions, comments, uh, remarks? <laughs> Okay, maybe a curiosity. So is it possible to conceive kind of garbage spot for all the, is it possible to conceive a garbage spot in these, for all this debris that you have, that a place where everything goes? Uh, the, the graveyard orbit. Yeah, yeah. The, the technical word is called the graveyard orbit. Mm -hmm. So it is, is this not a place, a specific place, mm -hmm. but uh, space agencies say that uh, um, uh, there are graveyard orbits where satellites could be safely placed. Safely means that they do not uh, harm, uh, harm operation, operative satellites. So what is the definition of graveyard orbits? I must say that uh, from, as a mathematician, I don't have a definition. And uh, I hope that uh, somebody from space agencies is listening to the talk. We need a more precise definition. We need a rigorous definition of graveyard orbits. And therefore, we need uh, more results uh, from the dynamical systems point of view. Mm -hmm. This is an open question. Okay, so. Sorry for a naive question. Wouldn't that increase the probability of collision then uh, in that orbit because of the highest, higher concentration? No, you put everything outside. It is outside. Uh, for example, if you go outside uh, the geostationary ring, uh, you don't have uh, many satellites in that region. No, 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 the idea is to have uh, an orbit uh, where you put uh, the satellites, and then, since it is uh, outside, uh, you have to, to have two conditions. Uh, one is uh, to be outside uh, the atmosphere, because if you are inside, uh, then there is a decay of the orbits uh, down to the Earth, uh, it, the, the, and the, the, the time of decay depends on the altitude. If it, the altitude is small, the atmosphere is... Uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, stronger, so that there is a, 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 a smaller uh, decay, a larger, de a smaller decay time. So assume that uh, you are outside the atmosphere, you are uh, above 2,000 kilometers of altitude. In that case, uh, the decay time is extremely, extremely uh, large, something like uh, 1,000 years, okay? Except that you are close to resonances. If you are close to resonances, for example, resonances with the moon, secular res these are called the secular resonances with the moon, the decay time could be smaller because uh, uh, the eccentricity undergoes large variations. Okay, so you have to identify regions where you don't have, for example, a web of resonances. So this is why we need uh, a worker from the dynamical system point of view. If you are outside these two conditions, outside the atmosphere, outside the web of resonances, the decay time is uh, of the order of 1,000 years. So um, even if uh, they, they collide, uh, the fragments will stay there for many years. We postpone the, the problem to the future. Yes, to, uh, to many generations. <laughs> too many now. generations to go. Okay. Oh, okay, so, <laughs> <laughs> so this... Uh, <laughs> discussion, but if there are too many debris, they will collide among themselves and then, then they will sure. decrease this, this orbit will uh, change. No, wait, wait a second, because if you are, assume that you are outside the, the web of the resonances and you are outside the atmosphere, 
even if uh, they collide, well, if they collide, uh, they typically stay in nearby orbits, okay? So they will stay there for many years. It is exceptional cases uh, that we observed uh, with our simulator, but this is a, it's a good question. So how can we see this? Uh, can we see this? Uh, yes, uh, now with the simulator, we can make uh, more experiments uh, to see whether the uh, collision between fragments uh, could bring us uh, some uh, debris to the Earth. But these are very exceptional situations. Okay, so if there are no more questions, let's thank uh, Alexandra for this excellent talk. Uh, I thank mean, you. And, uh, and we have a, a refreshment outside, so we'll meet outside. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you. you.